Thanks, Nim. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. So for the course of the next hour and a half, we are going to see how you can get set up with um, with your wallet, uh, understand what an NFT is, and um, and see all the steps that basically take you from uh, maybe no knowledge at all about NFTs and and blockchains uh, to having the ability to publish your own your own work uh, or collect the work of others. I saw this like some designers and artists, but majority of people who don't uh, identify as that. So uh, this will also be helpful to you, at least to understand the, the general concepts. I'm going to try to cover to cover everything. And um, and also um, I am going to uh, yeah talk about you know pros and cons and it, I, I try to stay very critical of of uh, of all of this as we go through um, because you know there are really good things about NFTs and also some more like darker underbelly and so we'll we'll talk about that too um, and as Nim said if you have any questions please do uh, do ask in the question tab so let me now share my screen uh, share screen. There we are. Share. Perfect. Okay, good. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So yeah, first of all, uh, before we get into any of that, I want to make it very clear to everybody that uh, you know this is uh, this is not an endorsement by Le Wagon or myself or anyone um, of uh, any kind of trading of cryptocurrencies, and that cryptocurrencies and trading of crypto cryptocurrencies incurs real risks. Um, there are, well, first of all, lots of uh, people who will try to use cryptocurrency to, to defraud you. Uh, and you should be extremely careful and read about existing crypto scams. Um, if people reach out to you on a dating website and uh, try to tell you to invest in something, please don't do that. Um, and uh, always research everything before making any transactions. That's essential. We'll talk about this again. But yeah, um, if you do decide to get involved with NFTs or crypto or blockchain in any capacity, you know, you are doing this uh, at your own risks, um, which do exist. So with this out of the way, let's get to the fun part. So <laughs> yeah, what is an NFT. So NFT stands for non-fungible token. And um, the technical definition is uh, it's a unique cryptographic asset recorded as a smart contract on a blockchain, which if you've never heard anything about NFTs, doesn't really help to understand the concept. So let's get past the mumbo jumbo and try to unpack what an NFT actually is. So a way that you can think of an NFT is it's a way to record and track the ownership of an item. Uh, and this item uh, can be and often is a virtual item, like a computer file, like a, a JPEG file. But it doesn't have to be a JPEG, and we'll talk about this in a moment. So in other words, yes, NFTs are the answer to the question, if a digital file can be replicated infinitely, how can we tell who owns the original? And this might sound like a nonsensical question, and and it can be um, a nonsensical question. It really makes sense only if we collectively agree that the concept of owning a digital file does make sense. So, like many things, it's a it's a construct. It's a social construct. It's a technological construct. It's a financial construct in some cases. So, yeah, we collectively agree that there is an original to a digital file. And that's the big change that NFTs uh, introduce in a way. So you have to note that the NFT is not really the file itself. So that's another mind bender here. Um, the NFT really is a tiny computer program that runs on the blockchain and it tracks who owns the item. So when you send it or you buy it or you trade it in any way, um, there is an operation that gets recorded in a database we call a blockchain. Um, and this will say, this person owned, the uh, owned that NFT, owned that item, and now something changed, uh, and now this other person owns it. And that's all that an NFT it does, and it, and that's all that an NFT is, really. So this kind of special computer programs, these tiny computer programs, they're called smart contracts. And there's many kinds of smart contracts, not only NFTs. Um, and they run on a blockchain, which is 
yeah, a kind of database, but also um, can be described the modern blockchains like Ethereum and Tezos and uh, Solana and others. Um, they have the ability to to run these programs and they act in this way like uh, a distributed computer. And this is a lot to take in if you've never heard these concepts. Um, I won't have time to get deep into the technical aspects of this. If you do have questions, you can ask them. I'll try to answer them. I myself not like a super technical blockchain engineer or anything. I'm an artist uh, pr primarily, and I know a bit about coding. So I understand some of the concepts. What I do recommend is that you, you research these and you try to understand as much as you can possibly understand um, before getting into this, even if we don't have time to get into the specifics, um, because that will make your that will make your journey much easier if you if you do get a little bit of understanding of the the underlying technology. It is possible to go in without this knowledge, but um, it will make you more resilient and more flexible and more more able to adapt to to whatever happens. Um, I have to say, like ever since I started with with NFTs about a year and a half ago, um, yeah, it felt like you know taking a hardcore university course by myself at home um, and learning so many new concepts I didn't know about. And so, yeah, if you start diving deep into this, there will be a lot to learn, uh, much more than we can cover in an hour and a half, obviously. But I'm trying to give you the surface understanding that you can then go and have the proper constructs and knowledge, like surface knowledge to go and dive deep into the topics that you're interested in. Um, and yeah, this type of architecture, smart contracts, blockchains, and uh, distributed applications or dApps uh, is what many, many people call Web3. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get into definitions just a little bit. So yeah, a blockchain, it's a system for storing information in a way that makes it very difficult or impossible to change the record after it's been recorded. That's like the simplest definition you can give of a blockchain. Um, yeah, there's a lot more to it, but for our purpose, that will, that will be enough. Uh, a smart contract, we said it, it's a tiny computer program that automatically performs an action when certain conditions are met. Um, like transfer of money, you transfer cryptocurrency to to the smart contract, and it transfers you the 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 ownership of the NFT. Um, a wallet, so a crypto wallet, and we'll get back to this. It's the key to your accounts, your tokens, your coins, uh, anything you own on a blockchain, and anything you're able to do. So that's how you sign your transactions. That's how you tell the blockchain. This is me, you can verify it, and I am allowed to perform this or that operation on the blockchain. Um, the marketplace, so the marketplace usually presents itself in the form of a website, and this is where you go to, to trade NFTs, to buy and sell and mint, uh, minting being publishing an NFT. Um, and this is... Well, I mean, you've probably seen other marketplaces. I guess, you know, like you could say Amazon is a marketplace. Um, eBay is a marketplace. But you have NFT marketplaces where you can trade, buy and sell, um, um, auction, do all sorts of things with NFTs. You may have heard of a marketplace like OpenSea that's very popular on Ethereum. Uh, Teia is one that exists on, on Tezos, uh, object.com. We'll see that in a minute. And Web3, I mentioned the term before, it's, it's a vision for a blockchain-based decentralized internet where online services and platforms are controlled by many token owners rather than a few large tech companies. Um, this is, you know, like the positive spin on it. There are a lot of uh, criticisms of Web3, people who believe strongly that Web3, the future of the internet, people who say it's a whole lot of BS and, and it's never happening and it's all based on speculation and it's a bubble. Um, I don't, I won't take sides on this in this course. Um, I am myself uh, a bit skeptical, but curious about it. And I feel like I don't know enough to, to take a side anyway, but do know that this is a very controversial topic if you haven't heard already. 
um, yeah, there's a lot more. I put some links there that you can go and, and use to learn more about the basics. And then I do recommend that you go and do your homework, literally, and, uh, and research this a bit more. But those are links that will be very helpful to you to understand the, the, the top level con concepts of blockchain and even a little more than that. All right. So we talked about NFTs. What are, uh, what are actually the kinds of NFTs that you can see? So if you've been, if you know anything about NFTs, you've probably seen what's called PFPs. Um, actually, what does PFP mean? It's a little bit unclear. So some people say it's photo for proof, uh, profile picture but profile picture, I don't know. But in any case, uh, PFPs are what most people think about when they think about NFTs. Um, they are these, uh, yeah, these avatars that you can use. No more sound. Uh, is, that, uh, is anybody else having a problem with sound? You hear? Uh, just let me know. Sound is okay. Okay. Mm. Seems like it comes from your end, uh, Sebastian. Um, so PFPs, yes, they are a type of collectible and they are meant to be used as a profile picture. Uh, for example, on Twitter, Twitter is a very popular social media platform for, for the crypto community in general, but the NFT, NFT people in particular, and they actually allow you to, to use, uh, an NFT as your profile picture officially in their system. It doesn't work for Tezos at the moment. It's only Ethereum. I believe this might change in the future or might even not be true right now. Uh, I haven't checked recently, but I think it's only Ethereum-based uh, PFPs for the moment. Um, things move very quickly in the NFT world, and I should say that in the crypto world in general. I should say that you know, if you're watching this right now, um, to the best of my knowledge, everything is current and true. Uh, if you're watching this a week from now, it might be different. Um, so I'm trying to give you all the more general, uh, generally true things, but Things change quickly in this uh, in this world, and you have to stay up to date and and keep looking at what things are changing. Um, all right, so artworks, yeah. So there's um, there's the PFPs, and then there's artists who are making original digital artworks and publishing it as NFTs. And contrary to popular popular belief or common common knowledge, what is uh, which is wrong. Uh, it's not just JPEGs, and you can't actually always right-click and save an NFT because there are uh, lots of different formats that are supported by different platforms, including, well, animated GIFs, that's a more obvious one, videos, but also uh, PDFs, for example. Uh, some zin people who make fanzines or zines um, are publishing them as NFTs, and even beyond that, you can make interactive NFTs. You can make NFTs that are like a small website that you can click and you can and that can change with time. For example, um, you can make an NFT, a generative NFT that is based on HTML and JavaScript and CSS um, that takes data from uh, like yeah, what time of the day it is, and then it looks different based on the time of day. Anything you can do with uh, web APIs, basically, um, and web technology, you can also do as an NFT on, on many of those platforms that we're going to talk, talk about today. Um, and then there are other use cases for NFTs, uh, which I'm less familiar with, uh, like using them for event tickets, uh, virtual fashion, uh, for games as well. Game assets is something that people talk about a lot. I'm not going to get into this because that's something I don't know much about. Um, but yeah, do know that those are other use cases that that are also quite popular in the in the NFT world. So yeah, why do we need <clears throat> why do we need NFTs at all? Um, there was a time when people were saying that digital artists and uh, artists working with virtual objects, like whether it's making illustrations in Photoshop or using code for your art, like I do, um, their work was hard to value and couldn't really be collected because you could infinitely reproduce it. You can make a copy of a JPEG and then it, a copy of that copy. And there's no, that you don't lose anything. If you take a picture of, a, of an oil painting, um, it degrades over time. Uh, it's not 
identical to the original already the moment you take the picture. Um, and so, so yeah, there was an aura to the artwork itself that couldn't be reproduced. But with the digital work, where is that originality? And in a way, you could say that the NFTs and the blockchain provide like a, a, a prosthetic uh, aura to the to the artwork, um, which allows artists to to finally have a market for their art because they can have scarcity, and that means uh, for something to be rare, for something to have limited supply, which wasn't the case typically for a digital file, and so this artificial or this prosthetic scarcity that you add onto the artwork um, really changed the picture, really changed the landscape for digital artists. And that's that's one thing that NFTs have already changed strongly. Um, and yeah, for artists can be a way to make a living um, in a way also that uh, compared to the traditional art market where galleries would typically take 50% cuts, uh, platforms take 2.5, sometimes 5% uh, platform fees. Um, sorry. And um, and since most platform also support resale royalties, and what that is, a resale ro royalty is the ability for, um, for uh, a platform on resale of an artwork to, um, to split the the amount of the secondary sale um, between the person selling and the original artist. So say I sell an artwork for one Tez, which is the currency on Tezos. I sell it for one Tez today. A year from now, I got really famous and popular and this artwork sells again for a hundred Tez. Um, what happens? In the traditional art market, nothing. Um, if I sell for $1 today and it sells for, for $100 in a year, uh, well, tough luck. That's, <laughs> that's it. And if uh, in the meantime, I stop being able to produce new work for whatever reason, um, well, my work might be very valuable, but I might still be destitute. That's something that happened to artists in the past and, and has been a discussion about royalties that has spawned the discussion about royalties. Um, now with this, you get a cut from resales, from secondary sales, which is typically between five and twenty percent on Tezos. That's a that's a common a common thing on Tezos platform. I think on Ethereum it's more usually around five to ten percent. Um, there are a lot of conversations around royalties. Let's not get into it. But just so you know, this is also an advantage of NFTs compared to the traditional art market. Um, and for collectors, NFTs offer a way to support the artists they like. Um, it's a way, if you want to see more of the same work, like if you like the work that an artist is doing, you can support them on Patreon. You can, uh, you know, like, uh, commission them to make special work for you. But now with NFTs, you have a, another option, which is you can collect a piece. Uh, you earn bragging rights in the, in the process. You can show off, Hey, look, look at those cool artworks that I bought. Um, and you get to see more of the same work being produced if the artist can make a living off of their work uh, through through NFTs. So those are various incentives that collectors have. And of course, there's also this more speculative aspect where you may be making a profit on the resale. And I'm not going to lie, that's a big motivation for a lot of collectors. Uh, it's hard to estimate, you know, like what's the percentage of people who collect NFTs mostly for speculation or because they actually like the work or a combination of both. But I have talked to many collectors uh, who get really passionate about the work and maybe, and some of them, you know, they get in through the speculative aspect, but they fall in love with the art. And so they become art collectors in their own right. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't think you can, you know, make a clear cut uh, statement about like, oh, it's all speculation or it's only about the art. It's it's a mix of both. And finally, um, you also have something that is called utility. And utility is um, the 
is is a feature of some NFTs that give you access to more uh, than the NFT itself. That might be something called a whitelist. So you get priority access to a future release of an NFT. It can be access to a metaverse, like a virtual game, uh, special uh, access to a Discord, to a private Discord that is only for collectors of a particular NFT. Um, so yeah, utility, it's, it's a controversial topic. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but if you hear the word utility now, you will know what it is. It's this, those extra perks that you can get for collecting a given NFT. Okay, I hope this is uh, still clear. If you do have questions so far, please ask them in the question tab. Uh, I will try to answer them. So yeah, do we have any, any questions so far? Is everything clear? I try to be as clear as possible, but uh, please do ask if you, if you have anything in the question tab, in the question tab. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, so what is Tezos? I've been saying the word again and again. Um, Tezos is it's an alternative blockchain to the to to Ethereum, which you may have heard of. Uh, Bitcoin is another blockchain, but it doesn't really have smart contracts, the things that enable NFTs. So Ethereum has been the the main one, but there are there are others. Um, uh, let me see. This is the question tab. Yes, yes, it is. Um, so. Yes, so Tezos is one of many alternative blockchains that do also support smart contracts and have a vibrant ecosystem of, of NFT platforms, marketplaces, um, and, and collectors and artists who, who publish on them. There's Tezos, there's Solana, there's Cardano. That's I think those are three of the more popular ones for NFTs uh, besides Ethereum itself. Um, the difference difference at the moment between Ethereum and Tezos uh, and also Solana and Cardano is that Ethereum uses something called proof of work, which is um, a way to verify the transactions that uses up a lot of energy because it requires making complex computation. Uh, well, actually not complex, but just energy intensive computation um, to, to verify that a transaction is, is valid. And Tezos, Cardano, Solana, they use something called proof of stake, which um, only requires certain computers in the network to perform this kind of computation, which consumes like a tremendous amount less of, uh, of energy. And for that reason, the Tezos ecosystem has attracted artists who didn't want to be on Ethereum um, and wanted this uh, like we're interested in having a greener option. There's also another reason for this, which is that uh, proof of work usually make its, makes it so that uh, transaction fees can be much higher. This is not entirely only due to proof of work. It's also due to the amount of uh, activity on the, on the chain. So when many people, oops, when many people want to uh, to collect a given NFT, they, the the fees can go up and up and up for the transactions, and that does happen on Tezos occasionally as well, though not quite in the same uh, at the same rate or at the same at the same scale. Uh, transactions on Ethereum can go up to several hundred dollars uh, for like you know minting an NFT or collecting an NFT. Um, on Tezos, typically it's like. 50 cent of a dollar to, to mint an NFT or less. This might change in the future, at least the, the proof of stake versus proof of work and the energy consumption aspect, the fees, maybe not uh, on Ethereum. Um, in, and that's, that's changed. Like I made those slides maybe like a couple of weeks ago, and this is, uh, this is already something that is changing. I told you things change rapidly. Um, Ethereum announced finally that they have locked in their transition to proof of stake and it's uh, state, like it's predicted to happen around the 15th of September. The exact date might vary depending on the, um, on yeah, the amount of transactions that happen uh, between them, between now and then. But yeah, this is something that you might want to keep an eye on if you're interested in, in that particular topic. Uh, not anymore. They are now discussing. Well, it keeps changing. <laughs> Thanks, Luna. So it changed. It's not 15th of uh, September anymore. See, uh, that was the case two days ago, but uh, things, things change fast. <laughs> yeah, it's been delayed many and many and many times. This, uh, this, the, they call it the merge. So yeah, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. 
they have to be proof of stake for five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, they have been announcing it for for a really long time, and uh, yeah. But I, I thought it was locked in. Looks like it's not. All right, <laughs> I'll let you discuss this in the chat. And no change in gas fees. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. Okay, so that's still an edge for alt uh, alternative chains, at least for now. So uh, yeah, so how do you get a crypto wallet? And what is a crypto wallet? So a crypto wallet, it's not like, you know, a physical wallet. I don't have one here on me, but uh, it's uh, so. And, and another thing that it's not is that it's not where your NFTs are stored per se. Um, you, you're better off thinking of a wallet as the key that allows you to access your assets on a given blockchain. So for each blockchain, you will have one or more wallets. Um, and these, I already mentioned it before, but I will say it again because it's important. Whenever you do a transaction, um, like creating an NFT, which is called minting, um, or buying or trading an NFT in, in, in one way or another, or doing any kind of meaningful operation that changes the data on the blockchain, you will need to use your wallet to sign that transaction and everything is called a transaction whether you, there's actually like you're actually buying or selling something or doing anything else it's always a transaction so when you do a transaction you need your wallet to sign it which means and signing i think is is self-explanatory almost but uh, like prove that it's you who is doing this operation um so so yeah the word wallet is also often used to describe uh, wallet management software. I would call it that, like uh, MetaMask or on Tezos, it's Temple or Kukai. Uh, we'll, we'll use Kukai for today. Um, but I feel like talking about a wallet, like keeping in your mind this mental model of a wallet, the wallet is the key. Uh, the cryptographic key, uh, actually, that allows you to access your assets and perform operations. Um, that's that's a better mental model. And it's also, there's also confusion when you talk about um, uh, a physical electronic device like Trezor, Treasure or uh, Ledger, which are um, uh, crypto wallets that, that exist physically. But, but those are just electronic like USB keys that contain your uh, private key and allow you to sign your transactions with an added layer of, of safety. And if you're going to do big transactions on the blockchain, it's definitely definitely recommended that you get a physical, a hard, what's called a hardware wallet. But, but really, the hardware is not the wallet. The hardware contains the wallet, which is that key. Um, so yeah, just in your mind, make that make that mental model and keep it uh, that will make it much easier for you to understand things that happened or when you read things about like oh people like broke into this wallet or this new wallet does this or does that um you you will understand it better if you have these mental model there's wallet management software there's hardware like wallets uh yeah those hardware wallets contain the wallet and and the wallet itself is is a cryptographic key uh, yeah, MetaMask cannot be used for Tezos. Yes, yes, I, uh, exactly. So Temple or Kukai are some of the popular options. I know there's one called Nan that is popular in, in India uh, as well, but I haven't tried it myself. So, so yeah, that eggs is uh, eggs of the unknown fox here in the chat. Eggs fox is uh, very knowledgeable, so feel free to ask uh, ask them. Uh, thanks for for explaining these these uh, subtleties. Um, can you show the slide for further research? Uh, what was the further research? I, um, I don't know which one, which one it was, but you'll, you'll get access to the slides afterwards. Um, okay. So yeah. All right. So that's about the wallet clarification. Um, so a wallet is it consists of two things a private key and that's something you should never share it is sometimes represented as a series of words i think 20 20 words 
um, that is called a seed phrase. Um, and you should never share your seed phrase or your private key with anyone under any circumstances, not your, not your friends, not somebody on the internet, not somebody claiming to be <clears throat> from a crypto platform, uh, reaching out to you by email or DMs or, or Telegram or WhatsApp or whatever. Um, never, ever, ever share your access, uh, any kind of credentials with anyone under any circumstances. They will not, legitimate people will not ask for access to your seed phrase um, or passwords or um, credentials of any kind. The other side, like that's the private key um, and the seed phrase. Um, the other side of this is the public key. And that's what's also referred to as the address of your wallet. And this, as the name implies, public key or address, you can share your address. Uh, this, this is fine. The wallet ad address in uh, on Tezos will look something like this. It starts with TZ uh, and then a series of letters and numbers. And your address is visible to everyone. Uh, you can safely share it. And the activity on your wallet is also public. And that's something you should, you should know because anything you do with your wallet, anybody can go on a website like uh, TZKT here and, and see, uh, and see what happened on that, on that wallet. So if I type, uh, if I type in the address of my wallet, you can see me and you can see everything that happened. I published an NFT called Sculpture Garden Berlin number two, uh, yesterday, and I sold three of them, uh, or oh, four, four. Okay. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and you can see that uh, those amounts of Tez came into the wallet, and you can have uh, you can have graphs of all of that. Uh, this is this is all public data, and that's that's by design the way that um, the way that the blockchain works. That any blockchain, I think some blockchains are privacy focused, but uh, but yeah, the transactions are are visible. That's uh, that's part of the way that a blockchain functions. Um, so yeah, which wallet manager should you use? I would recommend to start with Kukai. Um, it's a Tezos-based wallet, and it also works on mobile. Uh, Temple now has a mobile app as well, so they're they're little like they're sort of matched now for um, for for like feature feature wise. Uh, Temple has a an iOS and uh, does they have do they have an Android? I think they had the Android and now iOS as well. Anyway, so Kukai is web-based and it also works on mobile in a browser. So it should work on whatever device you're using. Um, and uh, we'll get into a st like how to create a Kukai um, account in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, you can use Kukai or Temple. We'll just use Kukai because it's convenient. So um, um, yeah, so here are more links that you can go to for uh, to learn more about wallets. Uh, you'll get that after the after the webinar ends. But yeah, how do you buy your first Tez? Um, so Tez is the token on the Tezos blockchain. This, uh, this the crypto token is the currency on the on the Tezos blockchain. Um, we have uh, so we can sell several times the same NFT. Yeah, you can set a number of editions. We'll see that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can decide there's 20, there's 100, there's 10,000. Uh, I think 10,000 is the, the limit. Uh, but yeah, from one to, that can be unique or it can be 10,000 editions. And you can reduce the amount of editions after you mint uh, if, you, if you don't sell everything and you want to reduce it to only the amount that got sold, for example. That's called burning. Okay, so, so yeah, if you want to get your first test and you will need you will need some uh, some tests to get started, um, and that's a that's a point that is important to clarify as well. Every transaction on a blockchain has a cost. You will need to pay a small amount of TES or XTZ is the symbol. Um, the cost is minimal, but it's not zero. So so if you mint a if you mint an NFT, so if you create an NFT, you publish it on the Tesla blockchain, you will need to pay a fee. Um, if you do anything meaningful on the blockchain, you will need to pay a fee. And so before you get started, you need to buy like maybe five Tez 
or you can also ask somebody who is already on there if they can send you half a Tez or a Tez just to make your first uh, few transactions. Um, and that that will you know get you far enough to to just get uh, get your first NFT out and hopefully you sell a couple and and then you have enough to do your next transactions. There's no guarantee, obviously. Um, that's something I should have mentioned when we talked about selling before, but uh, and and about you know artists um, supporting themselves with NFTs. There is absolutely no guarantee if you're an artist watching um, and you want to you know publish your NFTs or make an NFT project with an artist. Um, there's absolutely no guarantee that it will actually sell. Um, and uh, and there's no guarantee that we will be able to make a living from it. Uh, people who do are very fortunate, um, and it's also possible that you know it works for you for a while and then it doesn't, and you don't know why. So it is also a risk, and you should definitely not quit your day job to go into NFTs. That is uh, that is not a good idea, not something I would recommend. So if you do it, do it as a hobby, do it out of curiosity. If it works for you, and you know at some point, uh, at some point it does sustain you, that's great. But it's definitely not what. Uh, what happens for most people and uh and it is still a lot of work as well so it's not you know it, there's a there's a chance aspect to it there's a luck aspect to it definitely uh but yeah most likely you won't get lucky and and if you do it will also mean that you did a lot of work to get there and you could do a lot of work and not get there so i think uh, <laughs> i belabored the point enough now but um yeah so to buy your first test you can go to a trading platform uh, or crypto exchange exchange because you can exchange your dollars, your euros, your uh, yens, uh, your uh, whatever to uh, to Tezos in this case to Tez. Um, and there are too many to cover. There's Coinhouse, Etoros, and Go. I'm not endorsing any of those. Uh, just giving some options. You can you can find the one that works for you. Uh, that is uh, also like some of them work in certain countries and not others. So find the one that that supports Tezos and is working for your uh, for your in your country. Uh, also check with local regulations because uh, crypto trading may or may not be legal where you are. Um, maybe. Ethereum is legal, but Tezos is not. You know, you have to check these things before you get into it. Um, so, yeah, there you go. And, uh, and yeah, if you know somebody already on Tezos, you can ask them to send you a couple to get started. Uh, right now, I think a Tez, I mean, last time I checked, which was a few days ago, so it might not be true. Uh, last time I checked, the a Tez was like one... One euro eighty, so maybe I don't know, like one one dollar fifty, something like that. Let me let me check now. Uh, at the like at the moment when we speak, uh, it is at one seventy five euros. So yeah, that's the price of one test. Okay, so yeah, picking a marketplace very important. They all have their pros and cons, and they all support different kinds of uh, of files and uh, and formats. Um, in the Tezos NFT ecosystem, there's many different platforms. I'm not going to cover all of them. There's many more than the ones I have time for. Um, but here are some of the most popular, uh, popular Teya, FXHash, Versum, and Object.com. Um, I would recommend that you go and check their websites and uh, see you know, like how you feel about them. If they work for you, check the discords for each of them. And and see what the community is like. Um, it's important that you you know that you find a platform where the culture kind of works for you as well. Um, and yeah, so Teya is uh, well, it's a, always a bit risky to scroll stuff on Teya because you never know what you're going to find. But it's a, it's an open source community based platform. It's run by artists and collectors. Um, they have they are they're setting up uh, their own distributed organization that that is taking care of this. Um, so not one person on a, or a corporation owns Teya. It's uh, it grew out of the very first. Uh, like really popular platform on Tezos, which was called Hiketnunk, which was discontinued. And then the community of Hiketnunk went and started Teya. Um, FXHash is an, a generative art platform. 
uh, where you need to know how to code to publish uh, to publish stuff and all the work on FX hash is uh, is code based and when you collect something um, when you collect something on on FX hash you will see that uh, each iteration will be generated in a moment and look different from from all of the others um, some of them can be interactive um, let's see uh, can I show you something uh, so they all they all are a little bit different. Uh, well, those are all very different, but each of the uh, collections, you can see like subsurface fracture. Yeah, so this one is interactive, shader based. Um, so yeah, see, I can I can click and rotate it. Some some pieces have interaction, some pieces don't. Um, yeah, it's. Um, uh, can someone create an NFT out of the same artwork multiple times? Uh, well, you can, but it's not recommended. Uh, Trust, you know, it's crypto is supposed to be a trustless system, but I I find this term very uh, misleading in the sense that at least for NFTs everything is heavily based on reputation and trust. So if your collectors see that you're minted your same artwork on several platforms or several times on the same platform with different wallets or whatever you do. Um, you will lose all credibility and that will not play well for you. So, so yeah, you technically can. Uh, legally, uh, probably that could, I mean, you could be sued by collectors for uh, if you're, you know, if you're publicly, like if you're a public figure and people know you and uh, and you do this kind of, you pull this kind of, uh, of stuff on, uh, on chain, uh, yeah, this might have legal reper repercussions. Uh, I don't know of a specific case, um, but they're not in NFTs at least. But there have been there have been cases where people went uh, and and seek legal um, remedies to their to to things that they perceived as uh, as being scammed by by an NFT project. Mm. Hmm. All right, so that's FX hash um, Versum. Is um, is another platform that's uh, that's quite popular on Tezos. And uh, one one thing that I like about Versum is that it puts the art really at the center. Um, it's all about the art. You can also even hide the price and title and everything, and just have a gallery of art uh, that you scroll through. It also supports internet um, interactive uh, HTML based works, and so so yeah, you can. Uh, when you well, this is these these are videos, but I could show you in my own collection. Uh, some interactive works, which can be responsive as well, which is a really nice aspect. Uh, do I have some responsive ones here? I'm uh, promising stuff I can't deliver. I think this one might be, and um, if it's. If it loads, okay, fail. But but yeah, just you just you just have to trust me. You can make art that will like fill the screen, and uh, that's very pleasing. Uh, and they also have very nice UX. It's a uh, it's great design and lots of other nice niceties that I don't have time to get into. And finally, object.com. It's the it's sort of like the equivalent to OpenSea. I would say if you come from the Ethereum world, um, it's an aggregator that hosts work from a lot of different platforms, including the original Hicketnung. Um, uh, Teya, FX Hash are also there, and, and a bunch of other collections as well. So they try to index everything to to, um, to host all the collections from the Tesos Sika system. So it's a bit more of a, like, it, it has, in this way, it has less of, I would say, maybe less of a personality, but it's a one-stop shop for the whole ecosystem. So you can, you know, you you can choose what you want to do. Um, you, you might have to go and mint on all the respective platforms, but you can come and collect on uh, on object. You can also mint on object. They also have auctions, and um, yeah, they are they they have features uh, that now feature parity on all the platforms is getting is it's close to to there. FX hash also has auctions. Versum has auctions, so so it's not a differentiator anymore. But uh, but yeah, that's um, and Teya also has an auction system, I think. Um, 
but yeah, there you go. So yeah, already talked about each of those. Uh, Luke, all right. So uh, who are you? This is not a question. This is a rhetoric, a rhetorical question. So how do you verify who you are? You saw before when I was looking at my wallet, there was my uh, there was my avatar there, my face on it, and and a name. This is not by default. If you create a wallet, uh, it, it will not have your name on by default. And you can choose to keep it that way. You can stay anonymous. If you're an artist, I would recommend that you verify your identity uh, because that's how collectors can know that you are who you say you are. Uh, Tezos profile or TZ profile is the place to go for this. Um, you will need to have probably a good idea to have a Twitter account if you do this. Um, and then you can connect your wallet um, with, um, yeah, so here with Kukai. So let's do that. Um, uh, let's use this one. Well, let's see if it works. Okay, cancel request. I'm going to try again. Connect wallet. Uh, reset connection. Yeah, let's start over. So I'm going to show you how to connect with a wallet, and then, well, we'll see later how to make a wallet. But assuming you have a wallet, yeah, click on Kukai, opens it. It's going to ask me which wallet I want to sync. I'm going to sync this one, approve. Uh, yeah, and there you get to, to this screen. Um, that will let you verify, for example, your Twitter, uh, but you can also verify Discord or a website or even your GitHub account. And when you get into there, it will ask you to give your Twitter handle. Um, and if I type my Twitter handle, Sable Raf, it gives me a prompt. I can verify it with my wallet. And when I do this, it will give me a message that, that I can post on Twitter <clears throat> to get to get it verified, um, it's pretty straightforward. It explains it very well. Uh, I also I think I have the screenshots uh, for this in the your turn um, section of the class, so you you can go and do that later. But yeah, that will make it so that on various NFT platforms as well as these um, uh, blockchain explorers, you will get to see who is associated to that account as well as their Twitter account, which is very important for collectors so that they can check that you are who you say you are. And people were having questions about like, oh, can you post your artwork uh, twice? You can also post artwork that is not yours. And that happened, happens a lot and it's called copy minting. Um, and so collectors, savvy collectors do check that it's alleged Twitter account that belongs to the artist that is connected to that wallet so that they are sure that they are collecting the artwork from the proper artist and not from some uh, copycat. What For what operations is, is the verification required? It's not required, um, though I think for Versum it is. Uh, if you want to mint, uh, they have they have a bit of a stricter verification process. So so if you want to use Versum, you will definitely need to do the the to get your profile, your TZ profile. Um, but it's not required. It's just as I was saying, um, it's a security for collectors. Who wants to know? Who want to know who you are? If you're just a collector yourself, you probably don't need it. Um, but yeah, I'm talking for artists and like people who will mint NFTs or people who wants to, you know, give security to people trading with them that they are who they say they are. You can absolutely be anonymous on Tezos. Um, so yeah, it's not required for most things that you can do. It's just. Uh, yeah, I mean, I explained it already. <laughs> so yeah, but if you have other questions, please feel free to ask. So um, yeah, that's I wrote it this way. It's an important signal for collectors to know that you are who you say you are. Um, all right, so if you're an artist and you want to market your work, here are some tips. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read all of this, but yeah, it's very important to document your work, post work in progress on Twitter, um, tell a story, and uh, tweet regularly, but also like keep uh, your self-promotion to a minimum. And uh, in general, uh, 
yeah, just make connections, talk to people, talk to your collectors. If you're a collector, talk to artists. Um, they will tell you about, you know, the new up and coming cool artists that are uh, that are around. Build build relationships with people. Um, as I said before, you know, like it's the blockchain itself is trustless, but the the ecosystem and the NFT and the art world around it. Uh, that is that is growing now. It is all based on reputation and trust and relationships and humans talking to humans. So so yeah, just uh, you know, get to know people. Um, if you're not a people person, uh, find other ways to connect. But uh, but yeah, I, I definitely recommend uh, building a network with collectors and other artists. Whether you're yourself a collector or an artist, just talk to everybody. Um, be a you know, be a nice team player in a way and try to find how you can add value to the community and that will that will come back to you. Um, yeah, so, okay, risks and safety. This is important. We talked about it before. Um, yeah, again, I repeat it. It bears repeating. Never give your seed phrase to anyone. Um, learn about common scams. There is a page on the Teya GitHub uh, wiki that uh, does a great job at explaining a bunch of the, the existing scams that are around, uh, especially the ones that target artists. But yeah, there are scams that target everyone. Um, it's, yeah, if somebody comes to commission you, but they don't seem to know at all about your work, uh, that's a scam. If uh, somebody tells you that they're, you, you won something, it's a scam. Uh, if they come to you and say that you you infringed on copyright of an uh, unspecified person, uh, that's also a scam. So yeah, there's tons of different scams. Uh, do read up about them. Uh, one very one growing scam that is affecting a lot of people uh, actually affected somebody close to me, and I'm still mad about it. Um, is uh, is um, a mix of romance and Im investment scam which targets people on uh, social media, but also on dating platforms. And they, they reach out to you and try to build a relationship with you and then tell you about uh, this interesting investment. That's a scam. So yeah, if you know anybody who is uh, vulnerable, like somebody who's lonely and maybe a bit uh, down on their luck, uh, please do warn them about these scams because uh, there might be somebody in your family or your friends who is talking to a scammer right now uh, and slowly getting their way to getting robbed of their life savings. So yeah, I, I want to mention that because um, the more people know about this and are aware, uh, the more immunity we have collectively, to use a, a popular metaphor these days. So so yeah, um, and yeah, only trade what you or only store in a wallet what you're willing to lose, uh, especially if it's a hot wallet. If you are starting to have higher amounts, do use a hardware wallet. Uh, this is beyond the scope of this um, of this class, but uh, do read up on using how to use a hardware wallet if you're going to do significant amounts of trading. Uh, which again, I don't recommend, but if you do, be safe. Um, disable your DMs on Discord and Twitter. Uh, do not, um, uh, yeah, do not believe emails you receive that pretend to be from NFT marketplaces. Uh, most NFT marketplaces, at least on Tezos, do not send you emails. They don't have your email to begin with, so they can't send any. Um, yeah, don't click links in DMs or emails. Uh, this might be phishing attempts. Um, always confirm any information that you read from uh, official sources, possibly several official sources. Um, and this is related. Don't be in a hurry. Uh, take your time. Do your research before making any transactions. If you miss out on something, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it's better to be safe than, and 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 miss out on a drop than uh, than jump onto something and get robbed of your life savings. Um, yeah. Um, regarding taxes, I'm not a tax expert, uh, and in general, this is not financial advice nor tax advice, but do ask an expert about taxes. You will need the help. And, uh, even though in many countries, the law is really lagging behind and we don't, there's not really like very clear guidelines, do research and, uh, and ask experts to, to help you with it. If you start getting into it, always check the identity of an artist. If you, if you collect that's what we mentioned before to avoid the copy minters. Um, and yeah, if you do fall for a scam, 
do not believe anyone who tells you that they can help you recover the funds. Any transaction on the blockchain is final. Uh, people who say like, oh yeah, we froze the fund and we can return them. That's a scam. They are trying to scam you a second time. Uh, do not believe any kind of so-called recovery agents or anything like that. And finally, you know, you might be getting the idea that this can be quite stressful. Uh, it is, and uh, it's very important that you take care of your mental and physical health um, and try to ignore the fear of missing out as much as possible. This uh, this can be a really, like, it's a fast-paced and stressful, stressful environment. Uh, and, yeah, if you don't take downtime and uh, vacations and uh, and try to detach your own identity from what is happening on the blockchain and in the nft world um yeah you will you will suffer from it so yeah it's it's all it's all virtual it's all happening in this uh in this blockchain world uh it can have real life consequences but yeah uh you know please remember to touch some grass basically is what i'm saying okay um so that was it for the slides uh, but now I want to uh, to show you how to create a wallet, if we still have some time for this. I think we do. Uh, that's why I went a little fast on the last slide. Um, yeah. So to create a wallet on Kukai, uh, we're going to go to Kukai. Um, and I'm going to log out, sign out. Okay, create a new wallet. So yeah, let's go through this. If you have any questions, please do let me know um, so so I can answer them. But yeah, I wanted to go through this uh, because that's one of the important steps you need to get started. So you go, okay, so first thing, when you go to a wallet or an exchange or anything, this is what you should never do. Kukai, search on Google, click the first link. Never do this. Why? Because there is a common scam <laughs> that happened um, that and last year it was targeting Kukai actually, where the first link was a the first link was a sponsored link that was Kukai with two Ks and two Is, and that was a phishing site. Um, so be sure to always just type the address in your in your browser um, to make sure that you're going to the real one. Uh, don't trust either the the little um, uh, lock here. Uh, it's an indication, but it's now quite trivial to get uh, an SSL um, certificate on your website to verify that you know to get this lock. So so this is not enough. If you see the lock, that doesn't mean it's not a phishing site. Okay. So now that we are on Kukai, so k u k a i dot app a p p. Um, we can go to create a new wallet. And now I'm going to do something that you should never do. <laughs> I told you. What What did I tell you not to do? Remember me? Remind me. What, what should you never do? Okay, I'm waiting. Five seconds. Okay, typing, typing. Who's going to be first? What should you never do? Never share the seed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, yeah, that's true. Also, never click directly from Google. You're right. But yeah, never share the seeds is what uh, the answer I was looking for. Uh, so I'm going to click to reveal the seed word so you know what a seed phrase is. But I will never use this wallet, so that's fine. But you should never do that. If you create When you create your wallet, do it in a, in a room where you're by yourself. Don't do it in a, in a coffee shop with people around. Um, do this in a place where you have time and you relax. Uh, and that should be... That should be the case for any kind of stuff you do on, on blockchain. I do this when you're you know, in a quiet place um, and never do it because somebody tells you to do it and looks up over your shoulder or, or over your screen share. Um, this is the surefire way to get scammed. So yeah, but I'm going to do it now, but you should never do it. So yeah, so reveal the seed phrase. Um, so yeah, you should... Get write down your seed phrase, possibly on a good piece of paper, uh, and then store it in a safe um, or store it on a hardware wallet. Um, you can use what's called a hot wallet, and that's what Kukai provides. Um, it is, um, yeah, it's it's a wallet that can you can access from your browser. 
for larger amounts and longer storage, it's recommended to use an other wallet that will be your your hardware wallet. Um, uh, but but yeah, even the hot wallet, your you should store your backup your seed phrase in a in a safe place, which could be even as far as going a safe in the bank. Um, and obviously, never share it with anyone. So here. Uh, we're going to say that I wrote it down. So see, it tells me like, do not copy paste. Uh, so even copy pasting in the key, uh, in the clipboard, it's already a risk because other programs might be monitoring your clipboard. Um, so this is, this is a terrible idea, but I'm doing it to demonstrate. Uh, I'm going to do this in notion or, or uh, let's say notepad. Um, so yeah, so you should never do that. You should write it down on a piece of paper, but but I need to write it down to show you the steps, um, and I, I don't have time to write it on a piece of paper. But yeah, imagine you have a piece of paper with all of these uh, with all of these words written on uh, with numbers next to them to help you remember which order they're in. So I'm gonna do that with line numbers here in Notepad Plus uh, Plus. Again, never do that. <laughs> never, never copy paste your seed phrase. Never put it in a program. Never put it in a website. Uh, do what I say. Do not what I do. So yeah, we have our numbers. So this is what your piece of paper should look like. I'm clicking next, and then it's going to ask me to verify that I I wrote it down correctly. Uh, so what's between word six and word eight? Uh, that is length. So do that. Okay. Uh, and then what's between word 10 and word 12? That is this one. Okay. Uh, enter. Oop. What happened? Did I go back? Right. Oh, oh no. Okay. Ah, what happened? Okay. I don't know what I did. Sorry for that. Um, I'll, I'll do it again. I won't take the time to to put them back down. That's too much time. Okay, so uh, next, so vivid and glad, that's one. Uh, tiger and category, that's tail. Okay, pulse and oh, I see. Uh, I think I know what happened. Uh, pulse and twenty, that's an act. An act. Um, humble and welcome. That's bicycle. Bicycle. And finally, bicycle and struggle. That's welcome. Okay. Okay. Verify your seed. That's that's done. Next, you set a password. This is also something you should keep uh, to yourself. We're going to say Le Wagon. Le Wagon 2022. Oh yeah, that's a strong password. All right, no, not at all. Uh, Where have I gone? Twenty twenty-two. So now you could steal this. Oh, you could absolutely steal that uh, that wallet just with those information already. Two. Okay. Match. All right. So I'm not going to save that in my password manager. And there you go. So now we created the wallet and we have a public address. And this is something I can share. So if I shared this with you, you could send money to it. Uh, you couldn't take anything out. But this account now has a public address that, that is generated from the list of random words that we've seen before. That's the seed phrase, which you, you should never share. Um, is that clear for everybody? I hope it is. Um, if you have any questions about this, this is now the right time to ask them because this step is really important. And you will have, uh, I have screenshots for the whole thing here on, on how this works and how you can uh, how you can go and, and create your wallet. So if you missed something, you can either watch the video again or uh, go into the um, your turn part of the the online platform, the on the learn platform. Um, all right. So now, now that we have a wallet, uh, what the next step is to to mint an NFT, to mint your first NFT. 
So I'm probably not going to do that from that wallet. Uh, so let me, uh, can I connect? Uh, boom, boom, boom. Oh, I should have done that before. Okay, just give me a second. I need to reconnect to my existing wallet. All right. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm gonna read. So far, is it all for free? Uh, yeah, so far everything we've done is free. What is not free is gonna be adding like the next step after that would be to go to an exchange like we mentioned before and add some tests to your wallet and that's the part that is not free unless you borrow them from someone um so so yeah that would be the next step to go to to whichever exchange uh the crypto exchange buy you know five dollars worth of of tez for example uh and and put it on your wallet send it to your wallet should you have thesis before to pay for the transactions? Yes, yes, exactly. So you would need to you would need to fund this wallet with a little bit uh, in order to pay for the basic transactions that you need to do. Uh, okay, so wait, I'm having some trouble connecting. Uh, yeah, no problem. Okay, we have another question. What is the encrypted key store file? Ah, yes. So the key store uh the key store is a file that is storing your private key encrypted with the password that kukai makes you use so it is sort of safe but if somebody has the key store and your password they can get your seed phrase that that's 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 a very good question i should have mentioned that um so so yeah very important uh, to also save your key store file in a safe place uh, where people like, yeah, don't put it on Dropbox or something, but have it have it somewhere you you know is safe and that you won't lose it. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if you lose it and you have a backup of your seed phrase somewhere on paper in a safe at the bank, uh, you can still recover your wallet. But if you don't have the seed phrase and you don't have the key store or you have only the key store, then you lose the password then you will lose access to your wallet. Nobody can recover access to your wallet if you lose the seed phrase. That's another thing. Don't give it to anyone. But if you lose it, or if you lose the key store and the password, then you're out of luck. And don't believe anybody who says otherwise. They're trying to scam you. Nobody can recover your assets if the wallet gets out of your hands. Um, and that means losing the seed phrase, losing the password of the key store. Um, Okay, so I think I'm, I think I'm out of luck with my, uh, with my <laughs> reconnecting to Kukai today. Let me just try this again. One last try. Okay, never mind. Um, I'm gonna try. Oh, you know, I have another thing I can try. Okay, we still have fifteen minutes, but yeah, please do ask questions. Um, if you have any, I'm gonna I'm gonna not use Kukai. I'm gonna use Temple. So you you will have seen both in this way. Um, but somehow I can't find a way to reconnect to my Kukai right now. Okay, good. Um, all, right. all right. So uh, let's go to Teya. So Teya is where I would recommend you start if you want to do like to quickly test um, test how to mint um, because it doesn't require any verification. You can be anonymous um, uh, and you don't have like on object on Versum you need extra steps of verification and it can be a little tricky to get started if that's your first one. On object.com, you need to create a collection that will cost you one Tez. Uh, it's not a lot, but if you just borrowed like you know one test from someone uh, that might set you off uh, more than you can pay at the moment. So again, one test is one euro 75 cents. So it's not a lot of money, but uh, yeah, whatever. If you're limited uh, at the moment, uh, then I recommend to use Teya because yeah, you don't need anything to get started except your wallet. 
and still the transaction fees for for minting but yeah okay so there we go uh this is the mint page uh i mean i'm currently uh yeah currently in the dark mode but you can you can have light mode like that um i would need to sync with my uh with my wallet actually you know what i'm gonna do that again so that's that's how it would look for you if you get there for the first time you have to sync and you can select kukai wallet i would say like if you use kukai wallet do kukai wallet i'm going to use temple because i <laughs> couldn't manage to uh to re re log in but uh but yeah so you you would select it would be similar with kukai you would select your the wallet that you want to connect with if you just have one that's going to be the one uh it pops this up or with kukai it will go into uh another tab I'm logging in, granted permission, and now you can see that my wallet name is there in the top right. Um, I can go and see, like, manage assets is where I can see my creations. This is my test wallet, so it's just a bunch of random stuff. As you can see, you can mint the same thing several times. <laughs> uh, nobody will stop you, uh, but you shouldn't. Uh, this is my test wallet, so I do whatever I want, but, uh, but yeah, there you go. So, so that's it. And uh, now if I want to create something to publish an NFT, I go to Mint Object. Uh, and here I can enter my title. Let's say like Le, Le Wagon Special. Uh, this is a test. Uh, test NFT Wagon for the tags. Number of editions, we talked about that before. You can have a unique piece, or you can say there's 20, you know, just like you would if you were making a, a like a silk print, like a screen printing, or uh, like prints of an artwork, uh, or selling, you know, editions of books or photography. That's that's very similar. So I would say, like, yeah, for example, I can make 10. Uh, I'll say I want to get 10% of any resale that happens. And then optionally, I can select the license, say uh, Creative Commons, uh, no non-commercial, no derivatives, attribution. So you can uh, you can show it, but uh, it's not a course about Creative Commons licenses. <laughs> so you can you can go read up about this um, language. Oh, that's new. That's nice. Okay, so you can you can say which language it's in, but that's optional. I'm not going to select it. You can say if it's a non-safe, non not safe for work piece. Oh, that's a cool addition. Uh, photosensitive seizure warning, also very good for GIFs and interactive work and videos. Um, that's good. And then I can select the object I want to publish and see it can be like GIF, JPEG, PNG, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so let's say uh, paint, make a, let's make an artwork. Uh, gonna select red and uh, uh, Phil, and I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm, I'm a, an, ex, an experienced artist. And then uh, we're gonna make a gonna make a choo choo, a choo choo train. <laughs> Is that how a train looks like? I, I don't think so. Oh yeah, it needs a chimney. Yeah, there you go. Okay, file save. Uh, yeah, back on. Okay, download. All right, uh, and so yeah, thanks. See, I, I'm like a trained artist. Don't don't try this at home. At home, I'm a professional. Um, so so yeah, there we go. Preview. Perfect. Everything is fine. And I click mint. It's preparing the object. And drop your wallet address. Um, preparing object, and it should pop up my wallet. Uh, minting object should have made more than 10 editions. <laughs> There's like 58 people here. So yeah, at scarcity, artificial scarcity. Okay. Confirm. There you go. Confirming the transaction. I can open, uh, I can see the transaction in the blockchain explorer and, uh, and check it. This is, uh, with Kukai, it will look different, but here I can go and say activity and check 
that my transaction was pending and now it's applied. Um, object minted successfully. Oh, that's that's a cool addition. Okay, and now I go to manage assets. And it might take a while to appear because the index it takes a while to refresh. This is true of most platforms. Um, you might be you might need to wait up to like five minutes or more if the index is backed up um, to to see your work appear. So don't worry if you don't see it yet. It it will appear eventually. How much did it cost minting this? Um, Baker's fee. So this and uh, let's see what it says. Yeah. Burn fee, 0 0.07 Tez. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what, I mean, you know, one Tez is, is that really that little? I think there was, I think there should be more. Uh, uh, let me let's see, transaction wallet. Maybe there's several transactions. Cold Mint. Yeah, no, that's uh, 0. 0 0.02 Tez. Yeah, that's very small. Around five minutes on object, one minute around on Teya. Okay, yeah, so I don't know if it's been a minute. But yeah, there you go. Now it appears. In my... What is TZKT? Uh, it's a blockchain explorer, so you can enter any, any uh, like wallet ID or contract, like smart contract uh, address. And um, <clears throat> and see all the transactions that happened on it. I also use it to export data for tax for tax purposes. Um, that's that's you can also like select a range of dates and export all the data as uh, a comma separated value file. Um, yeah. So one last thing we need to do. So now I have minted. Please check the question tab. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, there's a bunch. Can you recover your wallet with just your password? No, no, that's not enough. You need the key store or the seed phrase. Uh, how is inheritance regulated? How will hers? That is an unsolved problem, and it's a very good question. You have to handle this yourself. Uh, inheritance, yep. Uh, you would have to, you know, give access to your seed phrase to your hairs in some way, like give it to a notary and have them pass it on. I don't know exactly how inheritance laws and regulations work in every country in the world, but yeah, they would need to have access to your seed phrase or password and key store. Uh, addition, so you should only mint only once, but in this one mint, you can have multiple copies. Yeah, that is totally accepted and that's part of the features. What software did we use, did you use to draw? <laughs> Uh, some online Microsoft Paint clone uh, that uh, is uh, <laughs> jspaint.app. Um, and what was the last one? How do you find your artwork with the smart contract ID? How do you find your artwork? Um, it, no, I would share the link. Uh, like I can share it in the chat. Uh, that's that's what I, I would tweet. Uh, I would tweet that link, for example, and say like, hey, I just minted this beautiful uh, artwork. Um, if you want to collect it, just go there. But right now, okay, so last thing. Right now, you cannot collect it yet because uh, an important concept, minting, minting only means you are publishing the artwork. It's like printing it and putting it, uh, and putting it up somewhere for people to see. But people can't buy it right now. Why? Because I haven't put it for sale. And uh, putting it for sale on Teya has a weird name. It's called Swap. So I need to go there and I can choose how many I want to sell. I could keep one for myself, you know, if I think like, oh, this is going to be very valuable someday. Uh, actually recommended if you're an artist and you're making your first mint, your first uh, your first creation on a platform is called your Genesis, Genesis, uh, Genesis piece, Genesis NFT. Uh, and I definitely recommend keeping one edition of your Genesis if you're not doing a unique, uh, a unique one. Or maybe you do a unique one and you don't sell it. But, uh, but yeah, your Genesis piece has symbolic value. Um, and uh, I didn't keep one on, of mine because I didn't know that, and I regret it now. So, so yeah, uh, good idea to keep one. So I'm going to sell nine of them, and I'm saying like it's going to be one Tez. So click swap and to swap i also need to to sign the transaction and it also costs like yeah see uh 31 cent 32 cent of a dollar 
that's the transaction price for putting it for sale and the minting price the minting transaction was probably around the same so yeah it's going to be like 60 cent uh for the whole thing right now so successfully submitted and this is again going to take another minute to update i can draw but don't know what digital software to use to store on a blockchain uh Genesis tweet is not worth much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what your question is, Carol. Um, you can draw, but you don't know what digital software to use to store in a blockchain. Well, I just showed you. So you can you can store your work. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, actually, the work itself. So what is stored on the blockchain is the metadata um is the metadata of the work. So you will not, um, yeah, you should always keep a copy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good idea to keep a copy to exchange with other artists. That's a good point as well, Fox. Um, but uh, yeah, the artwork itself, and this is a little complicated. I don't have time to get into it and we're already hitting on an hour and a half. But uh, the artwork itself is stored on something called IPFS, which is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed database. Um, and here is my my work on IPFS, like accessed through a, <clears throat> a portal called IPFS.io. But it's not stored on the blockchain. This PNG file is not on the blockchain, um, and it's beyond the scope here to talk about seeding and and uh, how to back up your NFTs. I recommend looking at uh, Club NFT. Uh, they are uh, the specialists in this, um, and you can uh, back up your NFTs with them. And uh, if you if you follow them on Twitter, they, you will find a lot of resources talking about why this is important. But uh, but yeah, what is stored on the blockchain is the metadata. This is this is what this is your NFT basically, or this is like the the record of your minting of the NFT. There you go. That's that's what it is, and and it has the address to the IPFS uh, file. But if uh, it's like a torrent, if if nobody's seeding it, then it's not accessible. And there are ways to to force servers to to serve it, to to seed it. Uh, but yeah, this is a this is a whole other topic. But yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, last question: Editions in terms of best earning strategy, is it best to stay with only one edition or have multiple copies to increase scarcity? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, price strategy, uh, yeah, price strategy is a whole other thing. Um, it it depends. It depends. Well, like like many questions, the answer is it depends. Um, there there's trends. Like at some point, unique editions uh, were very prized and people were revaluing them. Um, there was a time when large editions were a thing with very low prices, and like if there's a lot of demand, then it can be a good strategy. Uh, when you're starting, I would say it might be it's a good idea probably if you're starting and you don't have a huge reputation to make maybe and this might change in the future again things change uh, quite quickly. I'd say like you know around 15, 20 editions. Uh, at a re relatively low price, like say between one and five Tez, uh, could be a good strategy. Um, even five Tez, I don't, I don't know. Like it depends a lot on the following you already have and your reputation, and if you're lucky. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't necessarily make unique, like one one editions as a beginner, I guess. But it's better to do your own research on that and see what other people are saying. Um, because everybody has different experiences. Uh, and once you do get people who, to, who collect your work, it's a good idea to write to them, write to your collectors and say if you can, if they are identified as a Twitter account, to go on Twitter and send them a DM and say it's totally okay to write to them and say like, hey, thanks for collecting my work. Uh, you know, uh, uh, look at their collection and give them a compliment on it or, or say like, hey, uh, if you're interested, I can share some other artists uh, that do cool stuff with you. You know that's a that's good uh, good networking strategy, uh, and also you make friends this way. That's nice. Is there really a need to back up an NFT since since it's on IPFS and backed up several times? Uh, yeah, if if fewer people, um, if if your NFT doesn't get a lot of visibility, then it might get. There, there are already NFTs from early like from a year ago that are not accessible anymore. You can still, if you have the original file, you can put it back on IPFS, but uh, that's, a, that's yeah, 
that's a hassle. Uh, 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 parenting, what is that? Uh, okay. So <laughs> I'm not sure that's relevant. <laughs> Maybe you want, meant to paste a different link. Yeah. Okay. No problem. All right. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that was our time, I think. So, so yeah, if you have other questions, I'm happy to answer, but I guess this is, uh, like the cutoff point for the, for the body of the, the video, but I, I'm, I'm happy to stay a couple more minutes to answer other questions if there are any, uh, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you got the information you were hoping for and, uh, you